Hi, Richard. It's it's great to be here, and I'm thrilled to be talking about one of uh, a man that um, has changed American cities for the last 100 years, and he helped change and design Indianapolis. George Kessler was born in 1862, so about almost around the time that Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. was designing and building Central Park in the United States, George Kessler was born in Germany. And after various um, family moves, um, he landed in the United States, he landed in Dallas, and they eventually he landed in St. Louis. Can you tell us the highlights of how George Kessler affected Indianapolis? One of the most important things that George Kessler did was design a park and boulevard plan for the city. In today's terms, it's looked at as uh, a park plan for, oh, this is how we hook up our parks. Whereas at the turn of the century, for cities trying to compete, for the United States trying to be civilized and be comparable to European cities, designing a park and boulevard plan allowed competition between the cities. It shaped a, our city and it defined what a, an American city would look like, an ideal American city. And we didn't have that before George Kessler came to town here and to the United States. About what year was the, did George Kessler present his plan to Indianapolis? Um, it began approximately 1908, and he was hired by the city as landscape architect. And in the next uh, three or four years, there were different versions of the Park and Boulevard plan for Indianapolis, and he was here in the city until 1916. His career spanned 40 years and included over 230 known projects in the United States and world, and um, including 26 Park and Boulevard plans across the country. And, and there's more. Um, there's communities that he, he, de he designed. There's school campuses he designed. There's parks that he designed. He also designed 46 estates and residences, 26 schools. His work can be found in 23 states, 100 cities, and 26 communities. And what's even more extraordinary is that he was a one-man office. He didn't have a lot of employees. It was him, some drafting tables, maybe an office administrative assistant person, and I think one person worked for him. So all of this extraordinary work came from one, one man. You mentioned that he had studied various classes in, in mm -hmm. Germany. Back in 1880, was there a, a curriculum known as landscape architecture in any college? Uh, no, no. Um, so was he defining his own curriculum by yes. studying these areas of interest? Yes, Ger yes. Um, the um, Germans, as he was, but, but German town planning with writings beginning, beginning in the 1850s, um, began the, the scientific watershed of how to correctly design cities. The word landscape architect was not defined, I think, until into the 1900s, that um, proudly people were called landscape gardeners. And what happened in um, the early 1900s, uh, the, the American Society of Landscape Architecture was um, developed 
And an interesting note on that, the ASLA, is that Kessler applied and they said, oh, oh no, no, you're too much of an engineer. No, we don't want you. <laughs> on the other hand, he's one of the founding fathers of the American Planning Association. What was happening that from landscape gardening that everyone did, at the, in the early 1900s, there was kind of a split, and not a bad split, but some people stayed and they did residential design and the estates. And then other people, though, moved into planning and town planning or regional planning. They're both landscape architects, but there's kind of separation uh, into those different fields. Uh, he eventually was accepted at the ASLA, um, and but he was much actually more accepted in the engineering world. There's a lot of documents um, in engineering magazines that uh, he was re a respected engineer, which is very cool. He died in Indianapolis. He had had um, health issues in St. Louis but he had a good relationship here with many, many different people from all of his years working here. And he was having kidney problems. And so Dr. Jameson, who was also on the parks board, said, come on over to uh, Indianapolis, we'll, we'll help you with that. So of course he took, he took a train, how else? So from St. Louis here, uh, he uh, was going to have kidney surgery at St. Vincent's Hospital there on Fall Creek. And he was in there for six days. No one guessed. No one thought. There's even writings that um, to his nephew that I'll be home in a couple weeks and we can go do to this and all that. And then he died. So it was a surprise to everybody. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's interesting obituaries about him and uh, a all-round sadness of what cities lost, in particular Indianapolis, but St. Louis, um, Kansas City, but the loss to the United States of this incredible planner of planner of towns, because he was a nice guy too. He wasn't, you know, so it was a, a personal loss to many people. What do we see today that is indication of these parks and these boulevards? Boulevards, the word boulevard actually originates in Middle English, if not Old English, from bulwarks. That these were the earthen fortifications around a city. I love it. <laughs> and in Europe, not here because we're a democratic place. And the bulwarks then, when those European cities didn't need to be fortified with these earthen structures, trees grew up on them. People started strolling on them. The carriages started being on the boulevards. And so boulevard actually means the, uh, it's the, the circuitous way around a city. So in the Kessler plan, the first boulevards here, although it's not named that, was 38th Street, that that was his outer, outer boulevard, and it was called Maple Road, but that was designed there. Emerson was the eastern boundary for that. The city then was growing. So just like now that we have expressway and then expressway and then expressway, the next boulevard circuitous route around was being designed actually before Kessler passed away. That they already knew they needed another route out there. And happenstance is that Woolen Gardens is on, Mr. Woolens donated his land for a, a bird preserve on 56th Street. George Kessler was already designing, or about then, he designed Brendanwood, which was on 56th Street. 56th Street is the access to Fort Benjamin Harrison. So, the boulevard was being designed, 
And in honor of him, when he passed away, is when, is when it was named Kessler Boulevard because of him. And that boulevard then extends from about Emerson 56th Street all the way around, and then you have your South Drive, and then it actually ends up sort of down by 16th Street on the west side of the city. You've mentioned the boulevards that George Kessler mm -hmm. designed, mm -hmm. but he designed parkways and parks. Yes. Tell us about the parkways. Yes. His plan is called the Park and Boulevard System. So the parkways are our linear parks running into the residential districts of the city. So they're long parks, they're irregular shaped parks. One thing they did that you'll find that they're on some of our primary uh, river corridors and creek corridors, the connectivity of the parkways, the purpose was to conserve the river corridors in public space rather than having construction uh, up to the waterfront, taking it out of public ownership. But not only um, conservation, the parkways in Kessler's hands were also designed for flood control that he because of his engineering he actually regraded he dredged the creeks such as Fall Creek and used that to regrade the banks so that there were huge floodway areas to contain floodwaters when the streams Overflow. overflowed uh, he also designed dams there was a historic dam just east of Northwestern. That dam was purposely there to back up water for the electric company at the turn of the century to site the dam so that uh, at a convenient place, because what it was also there for is to pool the water for recreation, for fishing, and actually bathing, yes, because People at the turn of the century needed places to wash. What he tried to do with his plan was to connect the existing large parks that we had, being Riverside, Garfield Park, and Brookside Park. Each one of them then had connections with parkways and connections to each other. And then if that didn't work, you had your boulevards to get connected. Uh, and get get around the city. Each one of the large parks had its own identity. So if you got onto one of the parkways with your bicycle or your carriage and you used the parkways, every single place would be a different experience. Every single curve, he purposely made um, the curves in the parkways. You'll notice in his plans, you can tell his plans in the city because his drives are not these parallel corridors to the streams. There's varying widths and curves so that every, single, every day that you drove, each way that you drove, regardless of your, your manner of transportation, there would be different visuals. There would be a fantastic tree the trees would be changing, there would be open spaces, there would be narrow spaces, all for the experience of being in nature. Because George Kessler was German, and one of the critical tenets of German design, German ways of life, is sound mind and sound body. And in German town planning, there were um, purposeful inspiration of the people and such as like there may be statuary in some place there may be a fantastic tree what happened here that inspiring buildings were built and what I mean by that are that what you'll see along our parkways is that you'll find you'll see churches you'll see schools how high school is along 
our parkway. Inspiring places, churches, schools, and libraries. One of the prime locations to understand this is on Brookside Parkway and and bam, right in front of you is the incredible Spades Library that, you know, for moments of inspiration there, placed to inspire the kids, you know, get them into nature. So what you won't find is gasoline stations and regular commercial areas along the parkways. The parkways are for people. People need parks. Businesses don't need parks.